So this is to uh, this is to our Liberal candidate, and I'm going to let everybody uh, participate if they so choose. Uh, it says here, and this is just a statement slash question. So it says Canada has been accused of human rights violations against Indigenous people in Canada's human rights tribunal. Many Indigenous communities live in third world standards with inadequate housing and lack of fresh water. Why is the government continuing to underfund Indigenous peoples? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there's no question that, you know, in Canada's history, we have not uh, done very well by Indigenous people. I, I think, you know, all of us understand that. and. There's been great progress that's been made. In fact, Perry Bellegarde of the uh, Assembly of First Nations said no government has done more to advance First Nations reconciliation than uh, the Liberal government under Justin Trudeau. 84 boil water advisories have been lifted on reserves around Canada. Another 57 will be lifted over the next year. Uh, there have been very large investments in uh, First Nations communities around the province. Uh, we know that we all need to be, we're all going to be here together. We have to find a way to work together. I sat down with members of uh, the Synth Band Council earlier this week and uh, discussed some of the mutual uh, issues that they have around forestry, for instance, the transfer of the CAN4 license to Interfor, which is so critical to make sure that Adams Lake continues to operate, that in fact Dongtar continues to operate, that in fact Gilbert Smith gets the partition they need in terms of the cedar uh, that's available for their mill. Um, but we have made, I think, great progress with First Nations people, and uh, we need to continue to work at that. When Mr. Harper was elected, the first thing he did was uh, get rid of the Colonial Accord, which was you know, a, a recognized positive step towards reconciliation. So we've had to rebuild that relationship. Uh, we need to all walk together and, uh, and it's going to take time, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, I don't think anyone knows of a switch that we can flip to make everyone, um, you know, agree on the path forward. But I think we've made significant progress, and this, uh, the Liberal government is committed to continuing to make progress so that all Canadians can be prosperous and benefit together, working together. We can go that way. So, as I understand it, in fact, the, uh, through the Human Rights tr Tribunal, the government has been found to have uh, discriminated against uh, against uh, Indigenous people in terms of the funding provided. Uh, so the the answer to the question, I think, is simple, which is to provide uh, the funding that is required in order to provide equal services uh, to Indigenous people as to uh, the uh, as to non-Indigenous Canadians. And so the, uh, the human rights finding has uh, created a, a path uh, forward to address this particular issue. And obviously, uh, pursuing reconciliation is a, uh, is a, is a path, and it requires, uh, it requires more action on the part of, uh, on the part of Canada. And, and uh, uh, we hope to, uh, to lead that, that process. Um, but it starts with, uh, equal treatment, equal uh, uh, equal funding of the services that are provided through the federal government. As I said earlier in my opening, the federal federal NDP believes in the full recognition of the human rights of Indigenous people and that all Canadians have a right to be treated fairly. As far as I know, I believe we're possibly the only party that fully feels that way and believes that way. Um, I do agree with Mr. Lake. The federal government has come a long ways. However, I do believe they haven't come far enough. And as a mediator myself, I feel that the government uh, of the day can't just pick and choose which nations and which treaties they want to abide by and talk to and don't want to talk to. Um, Mr. Trudeau has proven that he can make happen whatever he wants to happen. He made a pipeline come across Canada and he still has, there are still nations in Canada who do not have safe drinking water. 
And again, that is, that is a, a human right. The sooner we get rid of this notion that Indian people are somehow different and therefore need to be segregated by this racist Indian Act, we need to get rid of that. And our party intends to do that. But the sooner we get rid of the notion that Indian people are somehow different. Now I've got Indian grand, oh I guess that's not the right word, indigenous or whatever. But my grandchildren are indigenous, if you like. I've made both love and war to Indians. And having experienced those two extremes of the spectrum of human emotion, I can tell you precisely what the difference is. It's absolutely nothing. The same things make us laugh, the same things make us cry, and we want the same things for our children. And the sooner we get to that, by fully integrating Indian people into Cana Canadian society as full equals, the sooner we'll get rid of the problems that we have today. It's the, it's the greatest humanitarian problem that Canada has ever been a part of. We've been at this 150 years. And look, look where it's got us. It's getting worse, not better. Uh, a demographic that supplies 4% of our population constitutes 26% of our inmate population. On the prairies, it's 75%. And it's not for lack of spending money. We've spent lots. But the, the sooner that we can integrate Indian people as full and equal members of Canadian society, the sooner we'll alleviate these problems. Just while I got a couple second, one, seconds left. Have I? Okay. Just try assigning special status to one of your children and see how that works out. Or a kid in a schoolroom, assign special status to one of them. See how that works out. Or in any group of people. And you automatically make them a target for prejudice. It doesn't matter, you know. And that is the cruelest, cruelest thing. I'm an advocate for Indians. I detest racism. And we have legislated racism in this country. I, I found one thing to agree with Mr. Finlayson on, which is that we have um, uh, institutionalized racism. And in, in fact, when Mr. Curry says that uh, the Canadian government's been found guilty at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal for violating uh, Indigenous uh, rights by underfunding their communities, not only were they found guilty, they've had seven orders of non-compliance made against them by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal for failing to adhere to the orders made by that tribunal. Seven orders. Now, when Mr. Lake said uh, Harry Bellegarde had something good to say about the, the Liberals, I, I think that might have been an old quote. Because when you have that many orders of non-compliance, it's hard to imagine that you have someone cooperative on the other side of the table. And not only are there seven orders of non-compliance, the legal battles that the Liberals are putting up against the Indigenous communities, and Cindy Blackstock is the name of the lawyer who's, who's uh, representing all these Indigenous communities who have been underfunded. Not only have they had these orders made against, they're continuing the legal fight. They're appealing, they're fighting every, every single legal uh, order that's come against them, rather than sitting down and saying, look, it's been, what, two centuries since we started exploiting, pillaging, exterminating your peoples. There are many tribes across Canada that have been exterminated. Rather than sitting down and saying, hey, why don't we get on with fixing these problems, they're still fighting it in court. That is not the action of a, a government that is, that is taking seriously the so -called, their so-called commitment to Indigenous rights and eliminating racism in Canada. Thanks, Peter. So just, just yeah, just yeah. I know I haven't forgotten you. I just wanted to be clear that we kind of got off the track just a little bit because it was a specific question. It kind of got around more into rights and things like that. But just as a reminder, the question was: Many Indigenous communities live in third world standards with inadequate housing and lack of fresh water. Why is the government continuing to underfund the Indigenous people? So that's what the actual question was. The last four years, my official role in Ottawa was the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs. And 
what we tried to do is be productive when the government we felt was on the right track. And, and certainly when we were government, we did a lot of work around water. They continued to do a lot of good work around water. In some communities, it's more complicated in terms of having people to, to um, take care of the systems. In terms of the children, we supported the, the um, children's legislation, the child welfare legislation. We supported the Indigenous language legislation. We certainly didn't support um, the First Nation when they actually would not support First Nations transparency, which was allowing community members to hold their governments to account. So they actually decided not to follow that legislation. We had Indigenous women in this country having to take their bans to court for access to basic financial information that everyone else has. But one thing I think has been missing, and I really did have a wonderful opportunity in this role over four years, was the communities that were really moving ahead were the communities um, that had prosperity and jobs and opportunity. And they were in all sorts of dip locations. They were urban, they were in rural, and their community members had jobs, and some of them had 70% or more own, own source revenue. We have so many barriers for the success of the communities to move forward in the way that they want to move forward. When you have to go to um, Indian Affairs and it takes a year to get a, something like a lease taken care of, we have to do better and we have to support economic prosperity. And the Trans Mountain Pipeline, I think, is a, a great example of many communities supporting that. They see opportunities, they see community benefits, and they see opportunities for their entrepreneurs. And that's a focus because it's really going to be communities taking advantage and moving forward. All right, thanks very much, candidates. So from the floor, do we have a question? All right, thanks for coming. I think it takes a lot of courage to sit there. Um, I actually don't mind paying taxes, but on the flip side, I want to be able to call an ambulance. I want my kid to be able to school, go to school, feel safe walking down the street. I get frustrated that you're always looking to squeeze more and more out of people. My challenge is what do you do with the stuff that you get already? The current governments and the previous government continually ignore the Auditor's General's report on government waste and inefficiency to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. We've got a payroll system approaching a billion. That doesn't work. If you were a corporation, they'd have figured out a way to pay those people. Um, the payroll system, billion dollars. I believe you mean well sitting here. You look like, and I know you are honorable people, I think once you get to Ottawa, you're caught up in the cog, the bureaucracy, and if you try and change that, you're out the door so fast, you, you'll just wonder what happened. So if you're going to get in, what would you do to change that? It's a decades-old problem. It's the same stuff every year, government inefficiency and waste to billions and billions of dollars. If you could fix that somehow, all this other stuff you're looking for and talking about, you would have the funds for that. Sorry, I don't want to speak on things. That's a good question. So who would like to uh, answer that first? Ian? Sure, so the, the, uh, the Green Party is talking about putting more power into the hands of the Auditor General and the other officers of Parliament, uh, taking power away from the Prime Minister's office, uh, and uh, giving some, uh, some real tooth to the ex Ethics Commissioner, the, uh, the Auditor General, um, so that they do have some uh, some enforcement powers as well, in addition to reporting uh, on the uh, the problems that they find uh, in terms of government. Um, so one of the uh, one of the things that I talked about, in fact, I think this was the third thing I mentioned in, in my opening that I'm talking about is doing things differently in Ottawa, and the uh, uh, the Green Party is a uh, is an outsider. Uh, in the sense that we haven't, uh, we've had, we have two MPs in, in Parliament in the last session for the last six months. Um, but our, uh, particularly our leader Elizabeth May has been a, a leader in Parliament in terms of working across the, uh, across the, uh, the political divide and, and dealing with, uh, dealing with all, all parties and all member of Parliaments to get things done. And so I, I think, uh, and most of the people I've been talking to at the doors think that there's too much of, uh, of the politicking in government and not enough of the government. 
Uh, so focusing on areas of, uh, so all of us are going to agree uh, that getting rid of waste in government, doing things better, uh, is a, sh and should be a priority. So being more efficient is, I mean, all of us are going to agree, and all Canadians are going to agree. How do we get there? Uh, by not sniping at each other, uh, by not playing political games, uh, by working together, by taking the Auditor General's reports seriously, and not using it as an opportunity to point fingers and blame and say, well, your government, your, the last government did this, well, your government is doing this now. Well, thanks for the question, and I think it, it, it expresses a frustration that may, many Canadians and probably Americans and probably Brits have about government uh, generally. It's, uh, it's a behemoth, and it is often easy to see how uh, waste happens. So you talk about the Phoenix Pay System. Um, you know, the Conservative government brought it in for, with good intention. It was to replace 57, I think, legacy systems uh, to pay everyone in the government, uh, you know, the same way and, and to be more efficient. I've learned in healthcare that every time you try to improve the efficiency of, of uh, IT systems, uh, you're going down rabbit holes, and this, this has been a big rabbit hole. There is a plan to fix it, and we have to fix it, and then replace it, which sounds absolutely ridiculous. And, uh, you know, I, I share your frustration. But over the last number of years, governments across Canada, provincial and federal, have brought in more transparency and more uh, critical eyes, whether it's the Auditor General or the Parliamentary Budget Office. So I think Canadians today, versus say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, have much more transparency about the way money is being spent. In terms of taxes, uh, we have, uh, in the last four years, we asked the richest 1% to pay a little more, and we reduced taxes on the middle class. And we have returned benefits to families in the, in the form of the Canada Child Benefit uh, to make life more affordable. But making government more efficient is a never-ending task that everyone up here should be committed to. And again, I want to thank you because we all should be concerned about that. And certainly, uh, from my experience uh, at a municipal level government, uh, it is much easier to not head down those rabbit holes and to be really on top of what's happening. When you have the federal government, I, I will agree with um, Terry here. It, we have to be conscious, we have to be watchful. What I do want to note, though, is we also have to watch the regulatory creep, because regulatory creep creates the challenges, and I know in the last four years we have 4,500 new regulations, so, so that actually creates some of the, the challenges that you're talking about, and it also is a real problem for our business and entrepreneurs. We did put a focus on it when we were in government, we had the Red Tape Reduction Commission, we had some really good recommendations that came out for every department. And that is on top of um, you know, the auditor's report. There was some implementation by, so health had recommendations, agriculture had recommendations, procur uh, procurement for defense, which is of course an ongoing problem. But that's where we have sometimes good work by one government gets left by the other just because it was done by the previous government. And that was a disappointment. So uh, you know, sometimes we have to say, let's build on the good work that a previous government has done through the Red Tape Reduction Commission, through reducing regulations, and, and keep on the right path with this. And, and we do, I know it's very, very frustrating for taxpayers when they hear those stories in the news in terms of wasted tax dollars. Can I just get the question exactly? I want to make sure I'm answering the, like, I, I heard some convoluted answers and I'm starting to lose track of the question. You go to Ottawa with the best of intentions, yeah. but you're going into a bureaucracy that's bigger than you and going to last longer than you, that in our perception sometimes wastes money dramatically, according to the Auditor General. How can you fix that? Oh, that's a... It's like the, uh, what do they call it, the eternal question of governance, right? Like, how do you fix the, the, the inefficiencies, if you want to call them that? Peter, how does communism Nothing. fix that? Well, how does communism fix it? Well, we ensure that uh, everybody's needs are met, right? Do you ensure that people's rights are, are not walked all over, as uh, Mr. Finlayson has talked about? How about the big government? You get your opportunity later. 
Um, actually, it's funny to, uh, I'll take this opportunity since Mr. Finlayson is heckling me. Um, because the other day, he's talked about uh, how his party wouldn't, uh, how they believe in people's rights and they wouldn't trample on them. Except when the time came to talk about pipelines, he said he would enact Section 92, which gives the government the right to trample all, all over your property rights and all, all, all over your indigenous rights in order to build things like pipelines. So that's where he and I differ. The Communist Party isn't about walking all over your rights for the sake of corporations. That, in fact, Benito Mussolini said, fascism should be better called, more appropriately called, corporatism, because it is the merger of corporate and state power. Now, when you want to walk all over people's rights, their property rights and indigenous rights, to build a pipeline on something, that is the definition of fascism. <laughs> now, just because Mr. Finlayson doesn't know the definition of fascism doesn't mean that it's not. <laughs> Thank you. Question was, when you get to Ottawa and there's, there's a perception in the Auditor General saying that there's a lot of waste, how would you fix that? Uh, or improve even. Or improve that. Does that mean Peter and I got to quit? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, we, we've got our own slump in Ottawa. And we need some housekeeping. Both Kathy and, and Terry are familiar with the BEMA. But our party believes in smaller government. And that, and that was kind of the basis for my challenge to you, Peter, on communism. Communism is big government. It, they, they like to interfere in every aspect of your life. Guess what other kind of government likes to control every aspect of your life? Fascism. Those two governments are bunkmates. We are the party of free speech, we're the party of freedom, we're the party of individual responsibility. Communism and big governments are all about total control. That ain't us. Is it here? Oh, sorry. Over the last two and a half weeks, I've had many people come up to me and tell me how courageous and brave I am to put my name forward, especially against two excellent politicians, such as Terry Dake and uh, oh, Kathy McLeod. Um, so I can't specifically answer your question, but I think if we keep doing what we've always done, we're going to keep getting what we've always gotten. <laughs> and I, I, I suggest it takes courage to do something different. And I believe I have that courage. And um, that's, that's my answer. I put my name on the ballot because I absolutely trust myself. And I, I know how, how um, I've acted through my life with work and union activity, and I have never been afraid to say what I think and speak out against things like what you talk about, and I'm still here. Thanks, Cynthia. So we're moving along really well. We still have about 40 minutes left, so we still got lots of time for questions. Next one coming up has to do with healthcare, and it basically says, uh, you know, we're all getting older, we're having more and more needs when it comes to regarding health care. So what would your party do in improving our health care system? Ken, do you want to go first on that one? Yeah? Okay. As I said earlier, the health care is a provincial, or we think in our constitution it says it's supposed to be a provincial responsibility, so we would turn it over to the provinces. Uh, in addition to that, for whatever role the federal government can play, the lady earlier brought up an absolutely brilliant suggestion for, for the tax credit, and of course the federal government would be involved in that. So yes, we'll take your brilliant suggestion for tax credits and turn the health care over the province where our constitution says it's supposed to be. Universal Pharmacare would be the first thing. No one should have to pay any money for their medications. Um, and then uh, we, the NDP has a platform for head-to-toe 
coverage, including dental care, as I said, vision care. That's the answer. So the, uh, the Green Party believes that the, uh, the solutions to our health care is, uh, is not just continuing to pump uh, money into the health care system. Now, we do believe in pumping money into the health care system because it is required to keep Canadians healthy. But, but rather than focusing on, uh, focusing on uh, illness, uh, we also propose in focusing on, uh, on health. And so uh, preventative measures uh, encouraging a healthy, a healthy country, including dealing with, uh, with environmental toxins and, and uh, the, uh, the climate crisis is a matter that is going to increase the health care costs of Canadians. And also focusing on uh, uh, refocusing on, uh, on mental health and, and properly funding mental health services. Uh, we have uh, we put forward a platform to decriminalize uh, drugs in order to uh, to deal with the opioid crisis, uh, which uh, then the overdose crisis is really a, a uh, with most of the deaths coming from uh, drugs laced with fentanyl through the black market uh, is really a, a poisoning crisis, and so. Um, we are, uh, and by, uh, by focusing on mental health too, we're, we are um, going to uh, fund, properly fund services for, for people and addiction and, and focus on making Canada overall healthier in addition to, uh, to properly funding the health care system. Well, health care is uh, very complex, but we must recognize that the Canadian system of health care, which uh, is uh, outlined in the Canada Health Act, and so the federal government does have a role to play, although the delivery is largely uh, through provinces and territories. We have an excellent system uh, for urgent care. You know, there's people that were on the golf course and have heart uh, pain, go to the local clinic here in Barrier, find themselves quickly transported to Kelowna and put, have stents that very night. This is the kind of system we have. I had a friend on the soccer field a couple of weeks ago that had the same thing happen. I saw him at the field yesterday uh, for the playoff game, and he is the recipient of a very good healthcare system in some areas. But if you need chronic, if you have chronic conditions, if you're waiting for a knee replacement, a hip replacement, it can be a long time. Those are the areas we really need to work on, and, and often those are involving uh, seniors and uh, uh, their complex needs that they have. Mental health is a big area. Ian uh, alluded to health, uh, mental health and substance use. We need to have a national standard for responding to mental health problems, and that is something the Liberal government is committed to. For too long, we've, we've basically said, here's your money provinces, go and spend it the way you want, instead of attaching some, uh, some caveats to that money, targeting that money at different uh, areas where we need to strengthen the healthcare system. So in the last round, mental health was a part of that. Home care for seniors was another part of that. And we need to continue to invest in health care. Uh, but it is complex. And I, as health minister for four years, I can't tell you that anyone is going to be able to turn uh, everything into the best health care delivery system in the world. But we have much better health care, much better outcomes and spend less per capita than the United States, for instance, but it still needs to be strengthened. And we all should be committed to coming up with ideas like team-based healthcare, oh, I'm sorry, uh, to improve our system. So we might be better than the US, but we're certainly not better than many countries in the world. But in terms of the federal government role, we are giving the health transfer guarantee. We um, have, said we are going to provide 1.6 billion in diagnostics for MRIs and CTs. How many times have you known people who are waiting and waiting and waiting for just the basic diagnostic tests? Um, we need to continue in the federal government, people might not be as aware, but they do tremendous work through the Canadian Institute of Health Research and they do groundbreaking in terms of some of the difficult diseases that we face. So that's certainly an important role for the federal government. And the final role that the government has uh, federally is 
we can support the doctor issue, and we can support the doctor issue in terms of, we did for rural communities, we did rural loan forgiveness for doctors and nurses that would practice in rural communities. We also created, again, I'm going back to when we were in government, we created additional dollars. We all might know someone uh, whose son or daughter went to Ireland or went to another country, really wants to come back to Canada to practice, there's no residency positions for them. So we provided extra money for the provinces to create those residency positions. Big area, complex, hugely important, but the federal government can and should play a role in certain areas. So if you want a free market, privatized medical system, look down to the south and there's 40 million Americans without health care. That's, uh, that's what some of our right-wing private uh, privatization, small government advocates are supporting. So our party absolutely does not support that. In fact, we, we say that healthcare is a right and it shouldn't, you, nobody should be making a profit out of delivering your rights to you. Pharmacare, medications, dental, eye care, everything related to your health is a right and governments have a responsibility to deliver that to you. When they say, oh well, find it in the free market, they're absolving themselves of their responsibility to ensure that your rights are protected and that you have the services to those rights. I like what they did in Northern Ontario. They have the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So they start building these schools in rural communities so that kids could go there and become doctors not far from home. And it turns out 94% of the graduates stay in the region where they went to school. So we don't have this, this in and out flow of people just leaving communities and you can't find doctors in rural communities. And you know where they got that idea from? Pretty sure it was from Cuba, where Cuba has three times per capita the number of family doctors that we have right here in BC, because they prioritized it. They said healthcare is a right, medicine's a right, we're going to prioritize that and make sure everybody has a family doctor. In addition to all those family doctors domestically, they sent over 10,000 health workers abroad working all around the world, helping in all sorts of crises around the world, including they were the leaders to fight the Ebola crisis in West Africa. You know, there are better solutions than the free market, clearly. Hi. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge an absolute fact that Canada needs immigration. A friend of mine waited five long years to come here from an ex-communist country, and he is very angry, and I am a little bit too, at the people willy-nilly, higgledy-piggledy, using the ARP RCMP as bellhops with their luggage while they're coming across the border illegally. You can't call them irregular. That belongs in the bathroom. Illegally. <laughs> They're not refugees if they're coming here illegally. So your question is your question to the panel is what's your position on immigration and how we can improve it? And how we can improve it. How we can stop this. Okay. Mr. Glick. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, they are not illegal. Uh, they are irregular border crossers. Canada has a treaty obligation to accept people that are seeking asylum. We do. So that's but let, let's talk about the size of the problem. 50,000 irregular border crossers in two years in a country of 36 million. So the problem is relatively small. And these are people that are largely escaping the United States where they first went because they're worried about Donald Trump deporting them. Now, Canada does need immigration. And I was happy to visit with two Syrian refugees that uh, are in Kamloops that have just purchased a restaurant and they're making a livelihood for themselves as we know very many immigrants do. This country was built on immigration and will continue to need immigrants to fulfill the labor demands that we have. We're not having enough, uh, enough kids to, uh, to fulfill the labor demand that we have in this country. Your point about illegal or irregular immigration is something that people are concerned about and, and we do absolutely need to address that, but I can tell you that those people don't jump the line uh, in front of other people who are going through the other forms of immigration that we have in this country. It's a relatively small number of people 
it has to be addressed for sure, but we are signatories of, of international treaties that say we must accept them and give them an ability to prove that they need asylum. That's a humane thing to do. I think we will all agree immigration is important. Um, I would say when you cross into a country, not at a port of entry, it is an illegal entry. Uh, and it has been determined by many that it is an illegal entry. There is a the safe country agreement and there was a loophole in the safe country agreement and the government did not look at closing the loophole. So, you know, they are responsible for not having had the conversation we did hear, there's many instances of people, they did fly, especially to the US, to make entry. And so it was a problem that they did not deal with and they did not deal with appropriately. We believe, as Conservatives, in a fair, compassionate, orderly immigration system where we prioritize the refugees that are truly, truly um, in need. And when you have, you might say it's only 50,000, but when that's, we take in 250,000 immigrants in a year. Um, that is taking up a lot of capacity from your system when you're dealing with that issue where they just simply didn't appropriately close the safe country agreement away from some you know, refugees in truly horrific conditions like the Yazidis and many living in other countries. So I, I would suggest that was a failure of the government to deal with the issue appropriately when it started, and it was to the detriment of the capacity of Canada to prioritize uh, people that truly have difficult living conditions, as I said, the Yazidis and others. It is a small number, as Mr. Lake said. It's not a huge number of folks entering, whether you want to call it irregular or illegal. And the reality is that folks traveling across borders is when you're leaving a war-torn country and your home has been bombed, destroyed, or you're a victim of... Uh, the thugs in Colombia, for example, in Latin America, eliminating people left, right, and center, indigenous people, union leaders assassinated left, right, and center. When you're escaping that type of environment, they don't exactly uh, process your passport papers very quickly for you so that you can travel abroad. People are coming here with nothing. You can't call them illegal when it is impossible for them to get papers to go through an immigration process. We're gonna talk about refugees. I, 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 like, have anyone here ever been in a country that's been bombed? Like, it, it is, it is atrocious. My parents lived through World War II. They were in Eastern Europe when the bombs were being landed. They agree, as, as much as they fought about everything, there's one thing they could agree on, which is there's nothing worse in the world and in, in your life that you will ever see nothing worse than war. And we need to be a lot more compassionate for those people who are leaving war-torn countries. Sure, so I, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm also gonna disagree with the with referring to the people crossing the border as illegal uh, for the reasons that Terry explained. Um, and uh, I, I think the uh, I, I think it's unfortunate that we have uh, that we're using the term that is associated with a very heated and very different issue south of the border, um, and so I, I think there are problems with the present refugee system, and there are problems there are problems created by uh, fifty thousand people coming across the border uh, in a way that uh, has not been planned for or expected. Uh, and we're going to see we're going to see more uh, global migration as a result of uh, as a result of the climate crisis in the future, and so we need to start properly funding our uh, our refugee system. And there have been steps taken recently. It took a little. It took too long for that to to take place. So there is a, a backlog. There was a, a, a large backlog, and it, it hasn't yet uh, reduced to an acceptable level. Um, but we do have uh, we do have an obligation uh, both uh, both legal 
uh, that is with respect to binding treaties that Canada has signed. Um, and also, in, in, my, in my view, in the view of my party, a moral obligation as well. Um, so we need to be, uh, we need to be humane. Uh, we also need to be more efficient. Uh, and our systems need to be properly funded. Um, and we need to, uh, uh, for, the sake of, for the sake of everyone, but especially the, uh, the refugees who are, um, uh, who are legitimate refugees facing uh, persecution or worse, uh, in their home countries, we need to have a system that, that deals with them effectively and, uh, and as quickly as we can. So I am not going to disagree with the three learned colleagues to my left that are in disagreement about illegal or irregular, but you've all come out here tonight and I'm going to, so I'm not specifically going to answer your question, sir, but I am going to, I believe you all have a right to hear part of the, our party's platform on immigration, so I'm gonna read it, hopefully within my timeline. Our immigration system should be accountable to Canadians and rooted in the values of fairness, respect, and dignity. We know that immigrants strengthen our country and we will always stand against those who would fear our neighbors to divide us. We believe in a Canada where newcomers can rely on a fair process and find success when they arrive. And where no one is separated from their loved ones for years because of backlogs. That's why a new democratic government will make sure that our immigration policies and levels meet Canada's labor force needs and recognize people's experiences, contribution, and ties to Canada. Thank you for the question. We believe in being compassionate to refugees. For example, in the late 70s, we took in 50,000 refugees from Vietnam when Saigon fell there, bombing around in a boat in the South China Sea. Those are legitimate refugees. War-torn upstate New York and Vermont aren't quite the same. We don't think that the, that's a legitimate refugee situation. There's no war going on where they're walking in from. Secondly, the people that I meet when I'm out there knocking on doors with the strongest opinions against, uh, against these illegal, and they are illegal, I don't know that you get to pick whether it's illegal or irregular, either you break the law or you don't, and I know as a truck driver, if I didn't cross at the border crossing I was supposed to, I was illegal pretty quick. Anyway, the people I meet out there knocking on doors that have the strongest opinions against this open borders policies, which apparently is Im imposed on us by some international agreement that Terry alluded to, we believe in Canadian sovereignty. We do not believe in the UN and other foreign powers dictating how we run our country. And apparently we're obliged to, according to Terry, kind of some agreement. We, we're getting out of the UN. We've announced that. I think even old Andrew Shear jumped on board today that you know we wouldn't be seeking a seat on the Security Council. Our leader, Maxine Bernie, describes the UN as a joke. And I don't know how else you would describe an organization run by unelected bureaucrats from corrupt countries uh, imposing their will on our Canadian sovereignty. So I think, yes, if you're an illegal refugee, you don't get to choose, illegal or irregular, you're illegal, period. When you and I cross the border at anything other than a legal port of entry, we're illegal. I guess that's a question. And then I guess we can also elaborate a little bit too on what you think of the CDC and you know continuing on sponsorship of that. So does that make sense? Sure. Okay, so, and we've got, we've got about 20 minutes, so we'll try to keep it as tight as we can, so we should have at least Time for one more question from the audience. So this is in regards to possibly the government subsidizing the TV and telecom corporations and what's your feeling on that. And then again, what's your uh, position on the CBC? Well, I think the, uh, the subsidy is for journalism uh, generally, uh, including newspapers, uh, Ward, if, uh, if I understand it correctly. And we've seen, you know, the demise of, of uh, journalism uh, you know, we used to have a daily newspaper in Kamloops. We haven't had one for the better part of seven years, I believe. Um, all across the country, we've seen newspapers close. And now, we don't have that reliable source of information that we were so used to having. And now we get misinformation, uh, often over social media. 
Uh, and to me, uh, I used to work in journalism when I was much, much younger. And it is so critical that you know, we have a robust uh, journalism industry in Canada to hold governments to account, to make sure that you are informed about what your representatives are doing, about what's happening uh, throughout Canada what, and what's happening internationally, so that you can make informed decisions about who's representing you and how they're spending your money. That has become more and more difficult as fewer and fewer people are willing to pay for a newspaper subscription or to subscribe to even online news. They, they would rather just get it free on their Facebook page. Um, what do I think of the CBC? I love the CBC. I moved to this country in 1967 when I was 10 years old. I've listened to CBC ever since. Uh, when I was a kid, that was the last year the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. And we watch them on CBC Hockey Night in Canada. CBC is part of what makes us Canadian. You could argue that, you know, that it's taxpayer subsidized. You know what? It gives us a Canadian identity. And I, I would not want to be uh, a Canadian without the CBC. It is, I think, a Canadian tradition that should be upheld, that should be strengthened, but also should be in competition with the private sector as well. Great. So I think it's I think it's very dangerous for the the government to be involved in picking winners and losers in the uh, in the field of journalism. Um, <laughs> among the measures that, uh, that we're proposing with the Green Party is to, for example, uh, put a tax on Facebook advertising, so that uh, so that there is uh, so there is some. Uh, so if there is a level playing field between advertisers and Canadians and one of the, the richest uh, corporations in the world who is operating um, uh, in, their own, in their own interests and against the public interest in the instance of, uh, uh, of journalism in Canada. Um, and uh, while I, and with respect to the CBC, I'll, I'll make that quick. I, uh, I'm not sure I would go as, uh, as far as Terry, I'm not a, Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Um, uh, in terms of my love for the CBC, but I, I do think it's, in, it's it provides an important public service and ought to be uh, ought to be sufficiently funded. I'm going to pass on this question for two reasons. One, it was directed to Terry Lake, and um, two, one thing that I was told right off the bat when I started this was not to make anything up, and I don't have an answer to your question. Well, we don't like this ABC. <laughs> we don't think it's very objective. We don't think the government has any business in, like Ian said, picking win and winners and losers, and that's absolutely what they're doing, because one of the commissioners that decides who gets the money I can't remember his name, but I think he's the head of Unifor, somebody... Jerry Giles. There you go. And he publicly stated that he's going to be Andrew Shear's worst nightmare. How is that guy neutral? And he decides who gets the money. No, no, he doesn't. No. What's he doing on the commission? He's on a panel to design the system, not to decide who gets the money. I may stand corrected, but I don't trust him. <laughs> so the state of our media is uh, terrible, frankly, um, and uh, I have a Bachelor of Journalism degree, so this kind of hits home. I actually went back to school to get my, I had a Bachelor of Arts degree, and then I went back and I got a journalism degree because I wanted to start my own magazine. I wanted to get in, uh, uh, you know, make a difference in that way. And then what I quickly realized uh, as we went through the program was that it's not about journalism, it's about selling advertising. That, that's the role of your media, is to deliver readers to advertisers. So CBC is an interesting point because if you listen to the major corporations, the private industry, they want CBC to be fully funded by the government, not privatized. Because right now, CBC is subsidized by the government, and they are in competition with the private sector media industries. And the, it makes it harder for the private sector media industry to, to compete with a government-subsidized 
industry, uh, corporation like CBC. So we support fully funding CBC as much as they'd like to air a lot of really anti-communist propaganda. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, it's really atrocious if you look at it objectively, the kind of stuff that they put on there uh, that, are, that is not based in fact, uh, historically or um, academically. Um, and I, I'm really curious why nobody is complaining about foreign interference in our election process from Time Magazine, right? Who broke the brown face thing? Was there a single Canadian uh, media outlet that offered to cover that? No, Time Magazine did it, right? We support the breaking up of monopolies like Google, um, who have, who control algorithms, YouTube controls algorithms, they determine what shows up on your, what I'm gonna watch next on that. That is an awful lot of power in the hands of one corporation. I'm out of time. I've been given the red card. I can't, I will after if you like. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. We all have time after. Kathy? Thank you. Or you can ask the next question. <laughs> ask that one. So I think um, the government is picking winners and losers with the fund. And as was pointed out, Jerry Diaz has a very clear preference in bias. And no, he doesn't actually pick the final people that got the money, but he did design the program. And as you know, you design a program, you get the outcome that you set out to design. So it really was a concern of us in terms of the structure of what was happening and how it, how it rolled out. You know, certainly our commitment in terms of corporate support in general is, you know, we've got to stop giving law balls $1.6 billion for fridges. Or we're gonna get rid of corporate um, welfare to the tune of 1.6 billion. The laws, laws, fridges, Bombardier, many, many examples of taxpayer dollars going to pri private corporations that, that shouldn't be. The one thing about, uh, as I say, when you pick winners and losers and you subsidize them, they don't then innovate. And yes, we're having challenging times and we all care about having media sources that are reliable, that give us good information. But when you subsidize something, you stop the, uh, the natural progression, which would be the innovation in terms of what next in terms of the future. And I think that's a, a problem with the sort of 600 million. All right, so I'm standing in front of my community right now. So my question is about climate change. We obviously share a responsibility with the world. Right now, it feels like gridlock to be able to act on it. I don't know if how we should be moving. So my question is, what are the next steps? How do we address climate change in a meaningful way that's substantial? And what does that look like long term for the resiliency of our country? And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, climate change, it's here, it's human cause. <laughs> Never before has it accelerated at this rate. The industrialization of the planet causes CO2. And, and I'll, I'll offer this uh, analogy. I ran it through my wife who happens to have a science degree in, in um, microbiology. Um, just so you can take back to other folks who might think that's, that climate change isn't a real thing. Um, it's like alcohol. CO2 is like alcohol to humans. A little bit is all right you might not even notice it in your system. You put a little bit more in there and you actually feel okay with a little bit of alcohol in your body, right? But you put too much in and your body is gonna get destroyed by that alcohol. And that's where we're at with CO2. We're destroying the planet and it's destroying us. It will destroy us. We're already, we're already sinking islands in the Pacific Ocean. There are uh, incredible amounts of flooding and damage. What we need to do is redirect our economy off of the resource extracted re re uh, oil specifically and turn that into in 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 industries that are developing renewable energy. The countries with the strongest economies, Germany, China among them, 
have already done this. They started doing this years ago. They have manufacturing. China is the per capita produce is 41st among the producers of CO2 on the planet. All the top 40 countries, capitalist countries. The model of exploitation and using our environment as a waste bank for the capitalist industries is what got us to this position that we're in right now. It's time to end capitalism. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh... So uh, we released our plan in terms of the environment and it is focused on technology, not taxes. The carbon tax is not at a level that is going to change behavior. Most experts say it needs to be much, much higher than it is. So it's high enough that it hurts, it hurts at the gas pumps, it hurts in your homes, but it isn't doing enough in terms of behavior. So technology, not taxes, targeting the highest emitters, but giving them incentives in terms of uh, research and in terms of moving to the new future. So the other thing that's an important is Canada is 1.6% of the global emissions. We need, I think we have huge opportunities to take the fight globally with things like our LNG. If you have LNG and, and shut down coal fired plants in other countries, huge opportunity. And of course we can, you know, we talk about climate change, but I think in the, the environment is much more than uh, just the climate change. It is our clean waters, let's stop dumping all that sewage into our rivers. Let's make sure that our use of pesticides is appropriate. So really um, having a comprehensive look at the environment period and doing, as I say, technology, not taxes, taking the fight globally and not supporting the carbon tax. Very hard to control. I was in, uh, been working uh, out east for the last couple of years, tornadoes twice in Ottawa Gatineau area that destroyed neighborhoods. So we are seeing the effects of climate change and I think a lot of Canadians understand that it is affecting them today. And we need to take steps to get to a lower carbon economy. But we have to do it in a way that doesn't shock the economy. Canadians are very concerned about climate change but if we, if we try to transition too quickly by shutting down the oil industry tomorrow, we will cause economic chaos and then people are more worried about putting food on their table than climate change and then we've lost the opportunity to make substantive action. So I believe in a comprehensive uh, climate action plan that includes the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion through the North Thompson and Kamloops, that's linked to a limit on oil sands emissions, that's linked to a national price on carbon, an ocean protection plan of $1.5 billion, and a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, part of which is planting 2 billion trees in the next 10 years. It is, a, it is a climate crisis. The science tells us that we need to move quickly. Uh, the science tells us that if we take the, the small steps that the, uh, the Liberals are proposing, or the no steps uh, that the Conservatives are proposing, uh, we will reach uh, runaway uh, global warming, which will uh, impact the, the future of my children uh, and uh, my hope to be grandchildren. And so that is why uh, young people around the world, in the millions, have been marching over the last two weeks to demonstrate to the, to the rest of us who have a responsibility to their future, for their future that we need to take immediate action. It is irresponsible to say that if we shut down the oil and gas industry tomorrow, that that's the... That, to make that the, the comparison, no one is saying that we're going to shut down the oil and gas industry tomorrow. But we have to say that we have to shut down the oil and gas industry in the next 10 years, 11 years. But by 2030, we have to drastically cut emissions. And if we don't, the science tells us that we won't reach the Paris targets and won't get anywhere near them. Canada right now is on track to, for emissions, it would be the equivalent of four or five degrees. The uh, science tells us that we need to limit our emissions so that we can keep the planet below one and a half at or below one and a half degrees. The plans of the of the other parties do not even propose to reach that. 
And so uh, we do have to take uh, immediate action. We also have an opportunity to transition to a sustainable economy, to for renewable energy. This is a big issue for me. I, it's one of the reasons I also put my name forward. I think we need to have the courage to do something different. I'm just not sure right now what, what that is. I believe, bless their hearts, the Conservatives really don't truly believe as a, as a party that climate change or is, even exists. And I feel the Liberals haven't done enough. And on the Greens, I, I feel they've come out and said that they will side with them. Um, in the end, they will side with the Conservatives and Andrew Scheer. And I really, I really think, um, this is something I have an opinion on, I, I, I really think that if you, they're, they're straight ahead, is wonderful, but by, by, by doing that, if that's what's going to happen, you're entrenching the right, you're forgetting about the left, and you're leaving people behind. And I believe that what needs to also happen is there needs to be true re reconciliation with indigenous communities because that goes hand in hand with climate change. Thank you. All right, we absolutely believe in climate change. Absolutely. We also believe in pollution. We do not, however, believe that carbon dioxide is the cause of climate change. And furthermore, we believe that climate change is a naturally occurring, occurring phenomenon. And we base that belief not on 16-year-old girls suffering from, what was it, Asperger's. 16-year-old girls that can see CO2. The first human being in history that can see it with a naked eye. We base that on scientists like our own Dr. Patrick Moore, one of the most preeminent environmentalists in the world. One of the first founders of Greenpeace, an organization which he has since left when they turned to uh, focusing on the environment and, and got more politically involved. We base it on a recent court case right here in British Columbia two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, by Dr. Timothy Ball against uh, uh, Professor Michael Manley, the guy that built the hockey stick graph for the United Nations panel on, on uh, global warming, they used to call it. He happened to miss a little 10 year period. He falsified the data. The BC Supreme Court concurred that he did indeed, and he lost the case. He missed the 1930s, one of the driest, hottest periods in the history of the world. So we don't, you know, we're not saying there isn't pollution. There's lots of it, and we need to address it. We can pump 7.5 billion liters of toxic sewage and chemicals into the Fraser Delta every day. What we are saying is that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. Carbon dioxide is good for the earth. It's the foundation of life on earth. Uh, we're at 400 parts per million. We've had periods in our history when we were 6,000 per million, per million. I think we're around 4,000 when we exhale. If I breathe on you, you're dead, sorry. I apologize that we won't get through to all the written uh, questions that we have. Uh, there's still three or four that were specifically for uh, Terry, and I guess it's because it's the government of the day. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow one, just one quick question to Terry. And Terry, it's in regards to, because we don't have a lot of time because we want to be able to get to the closing, closing statements and be out of here on time. So the question to you is, uh, one of the Liberal platforms is to build strong communities by creating jobs which will help grow the economy by respecting at the same time the environment. It says, please explain the Liberal government's decision to drop the tariffs on Chinese steel, but at the same time being allowed the Chinese to be able to provide steel to our West Coast liquid natural uh, gas plants, and why wouldn't we be able to use our own steel? So I'm not entirely sure if that's correct, but is that, 
Is that pretty much the question? So I think what they're alluding to is that we're bringing we're bringing in Chinese steel for those plants, and we're not able to use Canadian steel. So is it something that you're aware of? Or uh, I'd, I'd be happy to try to attempt to answer it. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, the relationship with China is very complex, and it is uh, obviously um, something that is a, a problem for Canada at the moment. We are being uh, targeted by the Chinese. Uh, our pulse uh, farmers on the prairies are being subjected to unfair tariffs. Uh, our pork has been unfairly targeted uh, artificially, and so uh, pork producers in Canada are being penalized because of of decisions made in China. Um, I, I am not aware of the steel situation, only that when the LNG plant, uh, you know, a huge, like $15 billion plant is being produced, they're obviously going to look for the cheapest form of materials for that plant. And I can just presume that imported steel from China is cheaper than steel produced in Canada. Uh, but I don't know that. I'm just presuming it. I do know that the government, uh, Christia Freeland, has done, I would say, a, a remarkable job of battling the United States and trying to get uh, tariffs removed from steel and aluminum produced in Canada and imported into the United States. But it is a very fraught world internationally with trade at the moment because of the protectionism of, 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 of people like Donald Trump that is being replicated around the world. We have to get a, to a better place, and I think the Liberal government has done a good job and will continue to fight on behalf of Canadians against those kinds of tariffs that uh, do impair our ability to uh, create jobs here in Canada. So now we're gonna have our closing statements. Again, it's the same uh, format, you're allowed three minutes. And we'll start with uh, the far, uh, far end there. The, I guess we call it the far left, but it's actually the right. <laughs> Let's hear Garrick from the uh, Communist Party. Let's hear it. Come on. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers, sisters, friends, and comrades. If you look back at the history of the, the role the Communist Party in Canada has played, we've been at the forefront of fighting for the most cherished things that we enjoy today. In the 20s, we were fighting... And our party is the second oldest in Canada's history. In 1921, we were formed. Sometimes we were made illegal, but then we came back. And, um, and in fact, uh, I, I dispute Mr. Finlayson's uh, supposition that his party is the fastest growing ever. Because when they made our party legal again, in that day, we got 50,000 members. Because they were illegal the day before, the next day they were legal. That. <laughs> That is fast recruitment. So, but back to my main point. In the 20s, we fought for unemployment insurance. In the 40s, it was finally enacted. In the 30s, we fought for universal health care. And finally, in the late 50s, the CCF adopted it in Saskatchewan, and the Canadian government adopted it in the 60s. We fought against illegal wars in Vietnam and elsewhere in Iraq. If you want to have a real say in reaching those humane parts of our society, you're going to have to start putting more capital in the Communist Party. We have influenced and pressured progressive, not progressive, we've influenced and pressured all parties at every level of government in Canada to start providing the basic social safety nets and the things that I, that I mentioned. I forgot pensions. Pensions was another thing that we were decades ahead of the, the game. 40 hour work week. You know, these are all things that communists fought for, that we all enjoy now. And you know who was fighting against us the whole time? Liberals and conservatives, right? Fighting tooth and nail to make sure that we didn't implement those things, the things that would benefit the working people of this country. Well, we're in the same battle. Still, conservatives, liberals, fighting against the things that we want to achieve, the democratization of our resources, of our communities, having democracy in our workplaces. The workplace in Canada is one of the most authoritarian, totalitarian uh, in institution that you will enter. 
How many of you elect your boss? Nobody. Yet you spend so much time in the workplace. Look, nobody has a chance of beating Kathy McLeod here. I made that in 2017. I said nobody could beat Mr. Millibar. <laughs> nobody could beat Mr. Millibar, and I was right about that. You're wasting your vote if you think you're going to support one of the establishment parties and have that influence the liberals or the conservatives at the top. Send a real message of protest, of revolutionary change, radical change, what the working people of this country need, and start voting for communists. Thank you. Well, I'm not quite sure what to say to that statement. <laughs> but anyway, truly, this is an important election, and what I'm gonna argue is that the Liberals don't deserve another four years. I don't think, um, in terms of a Prime Minister that has been found guilty of ethical violations, whether it was the Agacom Island or whether it was the SNC, we have the, you know, the Finance Minister happens to forget that he has a villa. We have, um, internationally, whether it be India, whether it be China, I am really uncomfortable in terms of the presentation on the world stage. And most importantly, is out of control spending. So I'm really, really, as I say, concerned. I don't believe that they deserve the another four years. We're going to put forward a plan. We have put forward a plan. And it's focused on affordability. It is focused on helping you get ahead. And many, many measures, because many Canadians are struggling. They're struggling to make ends meet. They're $200 away every month from not being able to pay their bills. Things like the universal tax cut will be significantly welcome. Returning things like the fitness and the child arts credit. Uh, seniors, there's a number of measures for seniors. Taking GST off your home heating bills. So certainly as conservatives, we will be very focused on affordability issues. We're also going to be very focused. Uh, we have promised to put a rural lens to um, decisions that get made by government. And certainly, believe in our natural resources. We believe that, you know, our oil, why should we be shipping oil down the St. Lawrence Seaway from Saudi Arabia, from Venezuela, when we have rich natural resources in our ground? We need to be proud of them. We have some of the best practices in the world. And unfortunately, you know, Ian, as much as you have a dream of a carbon-free future, we're not there yet. And why should Canadians be penalized and not take the opportunities that are available to us. So uh, really, I'm gonna take a quote um, from a politician that's been around, and if you can say who said it, he used to say, if you like me a lot, put a big X beside my name, and if you don't like me, just put a little X. Thank you. <laughs> well, folks, uh, I didn't come here tonight thinking I was gonna win you all over and make you all liberals. Uh, but what I would argue is that uh, Canada is doing very well. Uh, Kathy talks about uh, out of control spending. That spending is investing in families. Any of you that have children or grandchildren getting the child benefit, you know that that makes way more difference to families than a sports credit that really was helping people who could afford to put their kids in sports. When I knock on doors, in vulnerable areas of this riding, and I talk to young families, they know what a difference that child benefit has made for them. It's made life much easier for them. That's an investment in people. Doubling the gas tax to invest in infrastructure in communities like Barrier, Clearwater, 100 Mile makes real difference to your community. We've seen that happen in the past. We'll continue to invest in communities. I believe that I... Uh, worked hard for you in the past, and I will work extra hard for you in the future. I do believe that Ottawa has not considered rural Canada enough. The North Thompson and the South Caribou, all areas of our riding, need a strong voice in Ottawa that can tell them about the interior of British Columbia, about the forest industry, about the natural resources that we have here, and how challenging it is to live in small communities where you don't have all the services you need. You need a strong voice in Ottawa that's experienced, effective, and energetic, and I want to be that voice for you. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. So I, I woke up earlier this year as a 50-year-old, 
And I woke up and watched the news from time to time and saw fires and floods and record heat waves. And I contrasted the world that, uh, or the future that I saw for myself when my parents were turning 50 with the future that I see for my children if we don't do something different. And the science tells us that we don't, uh, that we don't have uh, the time to, uh, we don't have the time to make the small, incremental, gradual changes uh, that the, uh, the, the liberals are proposing or that the conservatives are suggesting that we wait for a technology to come along to fix the problem for us. I have an obligation to, to my children that I'm taking seriously by standing here and addressing you. And we, as a country, have an obligation to our next generations. So the science tells us that we need to, we need to act quickly. But thankfully, the science also tells us that we have an opportunity, that we can make a transition to renewable energy. We can make a transition to, to long-term thinking to planning for the future and planning for the jobs of the future. We can, uh, we have a plan, which we call Mission Possible, that includes taking, uh, um, taking immediate steps, uh, drastic steps in some way, to deal with a drastic situation to my children's future, to our next generations in this country, but also has within it that opportunity to transition to transition to renewable energy, to transition to sustainable industry, and to transition to long-term jobs, as opposed to the boom and bust cycle that results in, uh, periodically, uh, the loss of jobs, for example, in the forest industry in BC over the last, uh, the last couple of years. So I, I invite you to, to consider the science and to consider the opportunity and on October 21st, vote green. So I love Canada. I'm sure we all love, as we all do, otherwise we wouldn't be here and here today. I have grandparents and relatives who went to both world wars in order to give us all the chance to vote. And when I woke up on September 14th and listened to my voicemail and found out that the NDP didn't have a candidate, I needed to lead by example and do what I felt was right and put my name forward. Since I decided to run for the federal NDP in the Kamloops Thompson Caribou riding, I've had so many people come up to me, as I said and say uh, how brave, courageous, crazy <laughs> I am. Um, but that's never stopped me before. Having the courage to do what's right, taking care of others and putting people first are values I was raised with. But most importantly, they are the values of the federal NDP and Jagmeet Singh. Quoting Jagmeet, it takes an act of love to realize we're all in this together and an act of courage to demand better, to dream bigger, and to fight for a more inclusive and just country. Jagmeet Singh and Federal NDP's New Deal for People is here for you. I'm in this for you. On October 21st, let's turn the riding of Camel Thompson Caribou left side up and elect me as your MP in Ottawa. Thank you very much. Well, this is pretty lucky, I get the last word. <laughs> anyway, we hear a lot about science and climate change, real science. Like doc, scientists like Dr. Patrick Moore, an ecologist, a guy that studies the relationship of everything in our environment to everything else. Dr. Tim Ball, a lifelong climatologist. Uh, Dr. Willie Soon, an astrophysicist that studies the relationship of the sun and the tilt of the earth. All these men, including the Secretary General of the World Meteorologist Organization, that agree that climate change is a natural phenomenon and that CO2, the root 
cause of carbon taxes is not the culprit. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking after our environment. It's just that CO2 is not the problem. Our party is the party of freedom, fairness, responsibility, and respect. That means small government. Um, contrary to my friend Peter here, uh, who, who believes in more socialism. Socialism is big government. We believe in the freedom of the individual. One thing he did forget to mention when he was singing the virtues of communism was the 110 million people that communist governments have killed their own people, murdered. I don't think that's a virtue. We missed that one, Peter. Anyway, if you keep, if you keep, uh, what did Einstein say? If you keep doing the same thing and expecting to get a different result, that's the definition of insanity. Einstein supported so, socialism. <laughs> Very smart guy. All right. So on October 21st, maybe don't do the same thing. Maybe you'll get something different. Vote PPC. And we'll, we'll do it with what we think is common sense. Let's get back to common sense instead of fear mongering. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, candidates. Uh, first off, we'd like to uh, uh, present a couple of bouquets. One to uh, uh, Bertie Kershaw, who provided all the goodies for us tonight, and we're hoping that you're going to stick around afterwards to be able to enjoy them. And uh, I would give them to her uh, lovely husband, Bill. These are for, <laughs> these are for Bernie. And uh, these are for Bill Murphy for all that she did for setting up and helping us out with the time uh, keeper and everything. So, Bev, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, thank you. Okay. So, uh, Bill Kershaw, the president, the president of the uh, Chamber, has a few words to say, and then I'm going to wrap it up. So, Mr. Kershaw. Hey, Bill. Thank Let's you. Have a hand for Ward for keeping the lid on. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, I would like to thank all the candidates for taking the time to come to Bear to sit and explain to us. We are good. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd <laughs> also like to thank Ward for keeping it all online and keeping it in progress. So thank you to Ward also. All right, thanks, Bill. So again, thanks very much to the uh, candidates that were here tonight. All of them here, that's fantastic. I want to have a big round of applause for them. I'd like to thank, thank all the volunteers. I'd like to call Fair.